Central Bank of Nigeria advises beneficiaries of its various financial support through NISA Microfinance Bank to pay up. Federal government signs one billion U.S. dollar agreement with investors on solar projects. Securities and Exchange Commission goes hard on illegal investment outfit, and oil prices slip Friday with concerns easing over supplies. This is Business Express on a network service of the NTA, and we are reaching you from Abuja, the nation's capital. I am Benny Adams, your guide. Good to join us at that time we talk business i will start by telling you that the national economic council has held its monthly meeting presided over by the vice president professor yemi oshibajo with focus on nigeria's human capital development strategy an update on plans towards the implementation of the strategy while addressing newsmen after the meeting, the Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity, Office of the Vice President, Laolu Akonde, says Nigeria's human capital development has been adopted as a template for the development of the ECOWAS Regional Integrated Strategy. And the key message that was uh, delivered to the council members was that the commitment, that commitment at the federal and state level is critical to ensuring that there is increased investment in human capital development interventions across the nation. And so state governments were urged to uh, actively uh, demonstrate their buy-in in the human capital development program, as this is one of the most important factors for successfully achieving uh, the human capital development agenda. States are expected to design their own plans and strategies to maximize the impact of, uh, of, uh, of the implementation in their states. Lao Lu added that state governors have been urged to invest in interventions and high impact programs across thematic areas like health, education and labor to improve the human capital development indices in their states. The governors are expected to actively participate in the launch of the National Human Capital Development Strategy, which is slated for 17th May 2022, while making efforts towards the implementation of community-based human capital development projects in their respective states. Come areas and meet these expectations. Uh, it was also uh, recommended to the Council by the Human Capital Development Team that the enablers of good governance, funding and improved data collection is also an important objective that should be uh, an active part of the imp implementation of the human capital development strategy. Governor Inouye of Gombe State had earlier said members of the council have resolved to address issues of the ongoing challenge of power supply across the affected states following the representation or presentation of the issues raised by the Minister of Power, Abubakar Aliou. The World Bank says Nigeria's dependence on oil exports is the leading cause of frail growth prospect of the country. The bank disclosed this in its latest report titled A Better Future for All Nigerians, Nigeria Poverty Assessment 2022. According to the World Bank, the development leaves Nigeria's economy extremely exposed to movement in global oil production and global oil prices. It said in 2019, while oil represented just 10% of GDP, it accounted for more than 80% of Nigeria's total exports, adding that this leaves Nigeria's economy extremely exposed to movement in global oil production and global oil prices. The report said despite oil's importance, for exports, extractive industries are not a large employer in Nigeria. 
And the federal government is appealing to beneficiaries of the various targeted credit facilities to repay their loans to allow for further disbursement. Managing Director of Nassau Microfinance Bank, Abubakar Abdullahi Kuri, disclosed that the bank has disbursed 525.67 billion naira to 922,229 beneficiaries and is presently working on more than 13 million new applications for consideration. He says it's time to pay up or we collect through other means. Part of it is that central bank to do the global standing instruction. So once we activate it, irrespective of why you have your account balances, they will debit that account and refund us back our money for repayment at default. Also, we will put your name in CRMS. In that case, we cannot borrow from the back end also. Because once you put your name, you are defaulted. Once you go to take any bank, with any loan with a bank, that will trigger it and you may not be able to pay loan. So as part of reputation building, if you have reputation, you know that you can publish your name in the national newspaper. And once you publish your name, it means you can't take loan anywhere. So once you are busy, you cannot take loan. I did say it's, it's a bit more uh, restrictive. So people should try and pay back. Well, just yesterday, the Central Bank of Nigeria unveiled 21 maize pyramids in Kaduna State, which it said will boost maize production towards promoting food security and self-sufficiency. How will this boost food sufficiency and possibly exports? We will have the opinion of Akin Alabi of Corporate Farmers joining us from Lagos. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon from here in Lagos. Good afternoon. Hope you can hear me clearly. Okay. How is Lagos today? Lagos is fine. Thank you. Lagos is doing great. Thank you. Uh, good. It's sunny and oh. uh, everything is fine. Okay, good. Let's talk about agri-commodities. So, uh, 21 maize pyramids unveiled. What do you see happening to food security? Thank you very much. Um, it's um, one of the things that I tell people, basically as a stakeholder within the value within the value chain and the ecosystem, I say, look, it gets to a place in the country whereby we'll begin to get it right. It might be slow, but with time, we'll get it right. What happened yesterday in Kaduna is basically what I call a change of narrative, a gradual change of narrative. Initially, it's always been the rice pyramid, rice pyramid, rice pyramid, even majorly last year. Now, this year, it's a good thing that we are seeing a new narrative coming towards the maize pyramid. And the maize pyramid brings together an ecosystem whereby food can gradually become a stable, a sustainable crop production process for farmers. So what I'm saying is this, maize in particular as a commodity is an essential commodity that every ecosystem or every players within the production system, both FMCG, both feed millers, uh, both uh, domestic purpose, anything at all, is an essential commodity that is needed as an ingredient for food security. Today, majority of our producers, either in feed or either in manufacturing, require maize to produce their final products. And maize stands as a major commodity that we can never joke with today in Nigeria. Even in terms of production locally, it's not even enough to export. Now talk about Nigeria as uh, a country as a whole, because the demand is high, the supply is low. So definitely, we still need more maize pyramids this year to ensure sustainability and give farmers, especially the Maize Farmer Association or Maize Farmer Association, an area whereby they can say, we have enough of maize stored in our silo that can meet XYZ demands for local producers, i.e. FMCG, i.e. feed millers. So this process is, an, is, a, is a laudable one, but nevertheless, we we'll still need more of made pyramids across different states, either in Kaduna, either in Nasarawa, either in Jigawa, Kebi, either even in the southern part of the, of the country, we need more maize pyramids so that 
farmers can be rest assured, number one. Then also, producers can be rest assured, number two. Then off-takers can also be rest assured for a future food security in the country at large. So that is my basic opinion regarding what happened yesterday. As I said, okay, it's okay. a good Still Still on your opinion, though you say we, we need more of these maze uh, pyramids in other states. But uh, my question here okay. is, is it only maize? Would Is this enough to solve the country's food challenges? Still even talking about the maize, there, there was this issue of poultry feeds, which is largely dependent on the maize. That was so very scarce a month ago. What do you think should be done or can be done to ensure that this supply this this demand that this supply meets the demand thank you very much so th this is the sh this is the strategy that i i will i would uh, subscribe to now if you look at the value chain or who are basically the needers of maize as a commodity as i said in my earlier conversation i said number one the feed millers those are those who use maize to produce feeds for poultry farmers. And that is a major, or even is the major input for food today in the country. Across globally, maize is as paramount as anything. That is one. Then two, in terms of our normal, regular, um, daily manufactured uh, cereal, i.e. you use your Quaker oats, you use your, use your cornflakes, you use your uh, different things, cereals as, yeah, as it is, it for babies and for adults, maize is an essential commodity that is needed. So what I'm saying in essence, based on my earlier conversation, is what we are producing today in Nigeria is not enough. I'll say it again, it's not enough. So that's why I'm emphatically saying that we need to have more maize pyramids across the country, or we need to empower more maize farmers to produce tons and tons and tons of maize to enable us even meet our local demand. Because definitely as a country right now, we can't even meet our local demand, talk of exporting maize to other countries. Though we have been getting briefs that some, <coughs> some, some people are actually smuggling maize out of the country illegally. But again, maize production in Nigeria is not even enough to meet the demand locally, either for feed millers or for those who convert it into other products locally. So that is why I would say that we need more like an interstate or a collaborative partnership among our states and see how best they can grow maize emphatically across their states. Because today in Nigeria, maize is grown virtually everywhere. It's grown virtually everywhere. You know, by the time rain begins to fall heavily now, you see everybody on the streets with their, you know, maize cups eating and all that. But the question is, how best can we begin to empower maize farmers? so that they can even grow more, provide them with necessary inputs they need to have. Again, talking about machineries, tractor, these are important, mechanization I mean, these are important things that is required in terms of maize production on a very large scale. You can't be doing, as, a, as we are now, we can't be doing maize in just one hectare or, or two hectares or three hectares. No, we have to be talking about doing maize in terms of 1,000 hectares or more to provide enough sustainability and that is where federal government needs to come in, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of intervention funds, grants, loans for farmers. And we thank God for CBA and also the federal government are doing enough in terms of supporting farmers with agro schemes and funding. But it is not enough. We still need lots of interventions for maize farmers to produce more, meet local demand, meet exports, basically for feed producers and for, 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 for local producers. Okay, you just alleged that um, some farmers, or what I call them middlemen now, or businessmen, have engaged in smuggling maize outside the country. Are you implying that there is a temporal ban following the fact that we don't have self-sufficiency yet, lest we talk about exports? Yes, my brother. Yes, emphatically correct. Emphatically correct. You know, but again, as I said, all these things are critical. All these things need to be well streamlined. If in terms of, first of all, who are the producers? This needs to be identified. Local producers today, in terms of maize, needs to be well structured. Thank God for the association that is, you know, the Maize Producer Association. 
they are doing their own bits, you know, in supporting their farmers. And also the federal government doing their own bits in supporting farmers and CBN also funding farmers. But again, as I said, we still have certain bad eggs within the ecosystem. You can't take that out. You can't take it out. As I said, if it's well structured, well protected, it will give us a leeway in which farmers that are producing maize can begin to produce more. They will make money, create wealth, and also provide jobs. I keep telling people, agriculture is the only sector that can help this, gov this nation in providing more jobs across the ecosystem because it's big. Now, the question is, across this ecosystem of value chain, which of the commodity makes more sense? Which of the commodity is in high demand? My brother, it is maize. Maize as a commodity today requires a lot, a lot of production to still meet our local demand. But again, as I said earlier, some bad eggs are still there. The marketers, or basically the aggregators, or probably the middlemen, that still mop this maize up and probably take it to another country and bring it back again to the country in terms of selling over to us again, probably in foreign currencies, I don't know. This needs to be checkmated. This needs to be to, to properly checked and see, okay, where are the gaps? How can we control this process? How can we help manage this process? It still boils down to the government. So as I said in my conversation, I love the strategy. The main parameter is a good one, but again, it needs to cut across all states within the federation so that states can be self-sufficient majorly in mass production, which is a critical, a very critical commodity that serves as both input for feed producers and for local producers across the entire ecosystem. And maize is so significant that if we should fall in maize production, it affects other commodity as a whole. Okay, having highlighted the, the importance of maize both for household and industrial uses, what other commodities do you think uh, there should be much, much increased product Activity to get to meet up with the demand that has come to be higher now, could see this Russia-Ukraine war that has impacted negatively on commodities. Okay, two things, two commodities are very, very paramount. Two commodities are very paramount. Number one, wheat production. Wheat production is so critical right now that we begin to get uh, some some red flags that in in months in some months to come, there's going to be a high increase. Uh, high increase in price on uh, bread production. Bread production, yeah. The number of bread production. There, there's going to be because we are, we're going to lack. We're going to short short of wheat production in the country because most of the wheats are basically coming from EU. And now there's crisis among among uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Wheat production is a major center for us that we should begin to look at now and see how best we can increase production in that angle. That is one. Then number two. Let's have oil palm. Oil palm is also an important value, an important commodity that we also need to channel some level of funds and production into. Because the value chain or the ecosystem around oil palm production is so enormous. And if you can grow our agricultural industrialization, my brother, I'm emphatically clear and telling you today that if Nigeria can develop its agricultural industrialization process, it will to bring about a lot of employment and focus on strategic commodities that will impact the economy and make the economy grow as large as we as we are now today currently. So, agricultural industrialization is very paramount. It's going to create jobs and also help us sustain various commodities that Nigeria is producing now and expand on it. With Thank you with so very much. I quite. I quite oh, agree with you, Akin Alabi of Corporate Farmers. Thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts with us Thank at you. this particular point in time. Well, moving on, the country's investment climate continues to witness the spread of illegal fund managers, and this has become a source of worry to the capital markets community. Busted Abel reports that the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, has not relented in flushing them out of the market as promoters of the schemes continue to defraud the millions of investors who are promised overwhelming returns on their investment. One of the exercises took place in Garki, here in Abuja, where one Ovaoza Farm Produce Storage Business Limited was sealed by SEC. 
and we want to use this opportunity to enlighten the general public that before they invest, they need to visit SEC website or go to SEC website to confirm if that company is registered. Oil prices slipped on Friday with some supply concerns easing on expectations that crude exports would resume from Kazakhstan's CPC terminal, while the European Union remains split on whether to impose an oil embargo on Russia. Brent fell $1.56 to $117.47 a barrel, and U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude slid $1.56 to $110.78 a barrel, after both had dropped more than 2% the previous session. OPEC sources said the group's officials believed a possible EU ban on Russian oil would hurt consumers and that the group had conveyed its concerns to Brussels. And now, gold prices set for weekly gain as Ukraine conflict deepens. How are other commodities trading this Friday? Let's find out. And the yen faces third straight week of decline as Nigeria's exchange rate gains at official market. A look at the official exchange rate. The last trading for the week on the Nigerian equities market closed on a negative note as the All Share Index closed the market with 46,964.23 basis points. Market capitalization declined to 25.3 trillion naira, while 117 million equities exchanged hands in 3,873 deals, valued at 4.1 billion naira. For stock market activities on the global scene this Friday, let's join Neka Oko for a summary. U.S. equity futures and European stocks struggled for traction this Friday as investors evaluated economic risk from Federal Reserve monetary policy tightening and Russia's war in Ukraine. CAC 40 of France hovered 0.06% above the flat line. The DAX in Germany also topped 0.17%, while London's FTSE declined 0.19%. For the U.S., stocks were little changed in early trades after a bounce-back session on Wall Street. Contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average ticked down Three points. S&P 500 also dropped 0.07%, while Nasdaq 100 slipped 0.19%. In Asia, Chinese stocks fell as the rest of the region traded mixed. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index dropped 2.47% to 21,404.88. The Shanghai Composite also depreciated by 1.17%, while in Japan, the Nikkei 225 gained 0.14%. And back home, African markets plunged in early deals, with nearly all stocks in negative territory, except Tunisia's Tunidex, which gained 0.29%. And that's Global Market Review. I am Neka Ko. On that global note, we end this episode of the program for the week. Don't forget, you can access all previous episodes on YouTube. We value your feedback. Do join us again next week for a fresh edition. I am Benny Adams saying enjoy your weekend safely.